Thank you. So I'm going to present to you how Sprocket works. But first, I have to introduce myself. Sorry. My name is Rafael. I'm from Brazil. Uh, you can find me on GitHub with Rafael Franca and Twitter, too. I'm a member of the Rails Squad team. And I work at Shopify. And one of the things that I like about the Rails core team is that you can actually choose what you, you want to do in that team. And I like to say that I'm the person that usually do the things that nobody wants to do. So <laughs> I'm the Rails maintainer. That means that I usually release the gens in the blog posts in do issues triage so we can have nice people doing really awesome things in not doing this boring stuff. And I also have a secret to re review we here. I'm also the Rails bot. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, that's actually true. I run this bot sometimes. And that's it. So Rails is present in a lot of different ways. It's not just the Rails game, but there are a lot of different components, like ActionView, Springs, jQuery JS, Turbolinks, Sprockets. So you can see that the Rails project is present in almost all the layers of your computer, right? You have things on the process level, like Springs, and also things running in the browser, like jQuery, UGS, and Turbolinks. So this talk is to present something that is not well known, that is how the assets pipeline of Rails works right now. So I'm going to present it to you how, why do you need the assets pipeline, which are the chains responsible for it, and how it's work is in a Rails application, and I will get some time to show you how to extend the assets pipeline. So why do we need an assets pipeline? In, before we have assets pipeline in Rails, I think it was introduced in Rails 3.1, we had a, a question, where should I put my assets, right? We did not have any kind of convention how to handle client-side coding in the Rails applications, so we had to put our, our assets in the public folder. So we had no convention, no code organization, and usually you end up with a lot of files that you don't even know if they are being used or not. So Rails is about convention and configuration. So that was not something that we should have done with our client side code. And also we have another problem in that days that we had to do some trade-offs between code organization performance because browsers were had some limitations like the internet where it is low. So we have to do some trade-offs like should we create small self-contained files or do few assets requests in our applications? Should we write legible code or should we transmit few bytes to the clients, right? And also there were some technologies that were being existing that time that we are not using easily in Rails application like CoffeeScript, SAS, and recently ECMAScript 6. So to solve all these problems, we created the assets pipeline. And, but how these assets pipelines really works in Rails, right? So right now, how it works? We have some conventions for our client-side codes. So our assets lives in the app 
assets fold. And there are also lib assets in window assets fold. Assets are compiled on the fly in development and need to be pre-compiled in production. And we also had, uh, by default, assets name are generated with digest to do caching bushes. So the asset pipeline is made by, by a bunch of gens. These gens are these ones, Sprocks, Sprocks Rails, Size Rails, ExecGS, and Coffee Rails. And I'm going to each one and explain how they work. So the first gen that I'm going to talk about is Sprockets. It's the gen responsible to compile and save our assets. And it defines a, a processors pipeline so you can actually extend and build in different pipelines that you want. Sprockets has some key components that are processors, transformers, compressors, directives, the Sprockets environment, the manifest, and the pipelines itself. The processors are the most important components in Sprockets. They are any callable object that accepts an uh, input hash and returns a hash as metadata. So this Ruby code is actually a valid Sprockets processor. It's doing something that is easy to understand that is just remove the semicolons from the end of your JavaScript files because we don't need semicolons in JavaScript code. So it's take an input that has some special keys that I'm going to talk later, and it has to return uh, another hash that have the data as the result of the processor running. The input hash has these keys by default, the data, the environment, the cache, the URI, source path, load path, and the meta metadata are the most used keys on this hash. And the return hash can be anything, but there are some keys that are specials. The data key, the required key, the stubbed key, the links, and the dependency. So the required is, I'm going to show later, but when you actually have dependencies in your assets, you declare them and they are stored in this required key. So we have some built-in processors, but I'm going to talk especially about three of them. The Babel processor that is actually taking any ECMAScript 6 or whatever it's called right now, and transpiling to JavaScript code so your browser can run it. The CoffeeScript processor does the same thing with CoffeeScript language, and the Sales processor does the same thing with style sheets that uses the size language. Another kind of process we have is the bundle processor, and this processor is what is used to run and concatenate all the assets in an individual file. So to register a processor in sprockets, we use this syntax. We are telling that for any application JavaScript MIME type file, we are using the bundle processor to take care of these files and concatenate in the same in the same file. So the bundle processor takes a single file asset and prepares all the required URI in the content of it. And one special kind of another special kind of processor are the transformers. And a transformer is processor that converts a file from one format to another format. So the, one of the example is the CoffeeScript transformer that gets a CoffeeScript file and returns a JavaScript file. The implementation of these processors are really simple. 
I have the implementation here. So it's a callable object that takes an input and it actually goes through the script compiler and return the result of this operation as the data of the return hash. We also have the compressors, and compressors are special kinds of bundle processors because it runs on the concatenated file. And you register a compressor with this syntax, and the main difference between the compressor and the bundle processor is compressors are used differently, and you, you can have only one compressor by MIME types, so Sprox has a special syntax to enable compressors, and you can, for instance, compress any JavaScript file using this syntax. Sprockets has also directives, and I'm sure you all seen these directives before because they are just special comments that declares your bundles and the dependencies. This, for instance, is an example of the application GS that right now is generated by a Rails, new Rails application. So it's telling us that to generate this application GS file, we have to require these three files and also all the files that inside it the same directory of the application GS. So another special kind of directive that we have in Sprocket 3, where the precompile list that you are telling Sprocket to actually precompile these two files in production. And a part of that, Sprocket had a special support to procs on the precompile list so, so you had before in Sprox 3 we had this code that is telling us to precompile all the non JavaScript and style sheet files in the app directory. So as you can see this code is not easy to understand. So in Sprox 4 we have a new syntax for that. It's called the link directive. So is easy to understand what's going on there. So you can actually see that all the images in the image directory is going to be precompiled as the JavaScript and the style sheets too. And I can actually use this directive to compose new libraries. So I have that link to my engine that also defines its own manifest file. So it's now easy to understand and to compose it too. Not that we are going to remove the precompile list, but these new directives are there to help to extend the precompile list. So we have all these directives by default in sprockets, and I will show later how you can extend that directives to create your own directives. Another component of sprockets is the environment, and that is exactly where your, your code actually runs. The environment has methods to retrieve and serve assets, change the load path, and registering processes. So when you're doing a web request to your assets file, what is going on is that the sprockets environment is running and is trying to find that specific file and serve it back to you. So the environment is also where you call all those methods that I showed before that you can register the sormes, processors, compressors, and things like that. And a part of the environment, we have the manifest that is just a log of the contents of all your precompiled assets in a directory. 
and it uses to do fast lookups without having to actually compile your assets code. This object is really simple. It actually only points the assets path to the fingerprinted version that's generated by sprockets. So when you have in your code something like JavaScript, include the tag application, what's going on is that to generate that source attribute of the script tag, sprockets is going to the manifest object that has a hash like this inside that only maps the name without the dishes to the name with the dishes. And it also contains the opposite way where you have the digest name and you can find either the M type and the logical path of that file. This, another hash is used to expire caches of sprockets so you can actually uh, you can actually use the same directory and reuse the assets that you pre-compiled in the previous deploys. And you can later use this information to expire all the old assets that you do not want to be in that folder anymore. There are more things about sprockets that I'm not going to talk about here, but you can find information in the sprockets documentation and also the source code. There are MIME types, dependency resolvers, transformers suffix, bundle metadata reducer. So a part of the sprockets, the assets pipeline is made by the sprockets real genes. And as you can guess, all this gen does is to integrate sprockets to our Rails application. So it's defined the helpers that the we use in our application, like JavaScript include the tag and ja style sheet link tag. It configures the sprockets environment with all the configurations we have in the config initializer barra slash assets. And it also checks the pre-compile list. This is something not new, but it's since the sprockets tree. We can actually know when we do mistakes in, in development, not including some assets per compile list. And this change is responsible to raise this exception that is telling you that we need to include that full.js file in the manifest before actually using that in development. Another gen that we have is the size rail gen. So like I said before, the SAS preprocessor is built in, in the sprocket itself. But there are some particularities of integrated SAS with rails that need to be done in these genes. And we have, for instance, each gen defines the generators that we have when we are running Rails scaffold something, it generates new size files. It also creates an importer that knows about how to handle globs, paths, and ERB. And that means that if you have something like this in your SAS files, like using glob imports or trying to import it, some kind of ERB file, you need DGNs. Without DGN, you cannot actually make this work. And it also configures the size processor with all the information we have in our Rails application. The third gen is the exact GS gen. It allows you to run JavaScript code inside the Ruby environment. And it uses the JavaScript environment that is available to you in the machine. We have some options that is working by default in the gen, like the Node.js environment and the V8 Google uh, interpreter. And to use the gen is really simple. You actually run JavaScript code inside the Ruby VM. So here we are actually getting the CoffeeScript source code from the CoffeeScript website and compiling CoffeeScript code using Ruby. 
So, as you can see, DGEN is used by the CoffeeScript DGEN to compile CoffeeScript code to JavaScript. What gives us to the next gen that is the Coffee Rail gen. And all DGEN does is configure the generator. So, if you don't use generator, you actually don't need DGEN. And it also defines a template handler, so you can call handler CoffeeScript files from your controllers. So after that, I'm going to explain briefly how, sorry, how the assets are generated in development. So in development, when you have this code, the JavaScript include tag, it's going to generate this HTML code that points to the digest version of that file. Notice that after the application name, there there is a dot debug that is telling sprockets that the debug pipeline is going to be used. So when the browser does the request to that file, sprockets rails understand that that file is going to use the debug pipeline of sprockets. And the debug pipeline of sprockets is defined like this. It's actually a pipeline that is going to generate the your asset, but put a source map comment in the end of the file. So after the entire JavaScript code, you are going to see something like this. And this is telling your browser to actually get all the information about the source code in this source map file. So to build the source code of this file, assets, this project is going to use the, the, the full pipeline. This is inside the source map comment code. So that uh, is, I'm not going to show here. But the, the full pipeline is defined like this. It's just a, a small function call inside the sprockets environment. And what this function call does is check if you have any kind of bundle prep processor for that MIME type that we are going to Hinder and use that bundle processor to build the asset. For JavaScript, it uses the default bundle processor inside the sprockets. And the bundle processor will compile all the required files and measure all of them. And to compile each individual required file, Sprocket is going to use the self pipeline. And the self pipeline is defined like this, the same thing of the default pipeline, but calling a different function. And what that function does is build a stack of processors. First, it gets all the post processors of that MIME type, later, the transformers of that MIME type. And in the end, it gets all the preprocessors of that MIME type. And to actually read the file from the file system, it adds a new processor that is the file reader that actually goes to the file system and gets the source code. So it's built a stack like this, where each component uses the input of the previous component. So first, it reads from the file system and the CoffeeScript processor actually compiles the CoffeeScript code and returns JavaScript code. And later, the directive processors get all the, all the required and all the directives. So in the end, the bundle processor measure off them and the result is sent back to the browser. So this is how the assets compilation works in development. And the, differ the key difference between development and production and is that in production, all of this happens in the pre compiled task, and only static asset is returned to the browser. So nothing of that is going to 
happens in runtime. So how to we can use all this knowledge to extend these pockets? We can, for instance, create new directives. So this code is actually real. It's from the Shopify application. We have a NPM directive that goes to your node models path and try to get the dependencies from the NPM installation. So we create a, a new directive processor that's inherited from the Sprocket directive processor. And Sprocket use a convention that every single method that starts with process and ends with directive is going to be used to the directive processor. So if you have the NPM directive, the method is process NPM directive. And after that, we just register that preprocessor for all the JavaScript files, and we instantiate the direct processor. So, and we can use this kind of thing in our JavaScript components now. We can actually load the load dash library from the NPM model installation. Another, another example that we have in in the Shopify application is we actually have a lot of images that are SVG, but we have to actually support EA8, I think. So we have to convert them from SVG to PNG. So that all happens automatically in the assets precompiling. Pre all we need to do is to register a transformer from SVG to PNG. So we can use something like this, like we can actually ask to generate the full PNG file from the full SVG file that we only have the SVG version in our file system. Or we can also ask to generate all the PNG files from all the SVG files that are inside the images folder. And the code to do that is really simple. This is the real code. It's just a um, call method that actually gets the input that is the SVG source code and ask the RMESH keychain to generate a PNG file and we return that PNG file in the data. So my effort in this talk is that I know that Sprockets is used in many Rails applications right now, but many users don't know how, don't even know how it exists. Many users don't know how it works. It didn't I was not, I did not know how it worked two years ago. So it's important to you to try to understand your tools, documenting or understand doing talks or writing documentation for these tools and share with the community. So we are right now, right now in the effort to save its pockets. So you can see more about that to, tomorrow in the T-shirt talk. Let's call it Savings Brockets, of course. And that's it. So we are hiring in Shopify, so if you want to work with me, we have a lot of different open positions right now for all the different offices. We, you can talk with our team in the zip room. So there is a Shopify booth there, and also, we had two talks before mine from Shopify people, and we are going to have more too. So we have today how we test Rails at scale at Shopify, I think after this talk. And we are going out to see the Rails 5 features that you heard a lot about uh, with Sean Griffin. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>